age is coming to an end, my friend. Twilight is falling. At all during the, the show hit me right. Arise, minions, and welcome to Unmade Gaming. We are here with our uh, special casting crew for the Twist of Fate, a.k.a. the Atari Twilight Keystone group. Uh, so, we are here for episode two. Uh, this one is called something that Greg put in the chat here. Uh, Garrett Maryland, tear down this wall. Uh, so, this is our mini series for Atari Twilight. This branches between Atari Twilight Season 2 and Atari Twilight Season 3 coming soon. Uh, but... Without further ado, uh, I will do my normal spiel and pass this off to get the hell out of here. If you guys like what we do here and you want to support the channel, the best way to do that is on Patreon. Link for that down below. And as always, in the bottom right-hand corner, you will see the corruption bar. That bar serves two purposes. One is when that bar fills, Greg gets to do the hell he wants to these people. And two, every single dollar that goes into that goes back to this uh, channel for production. All kinds of cool art and sweet, you know, zippity-zappity movies and all that kind of cool shit. Um, and music and all kinds of fun things. Uh, that being said... I turn things over to Greg to take us back to the 80s. Greg? Thank you so much, buddy. And once again, thank you for uh, letting me tell this story with this wonderful group and with yourself here uh, on Unmade Gaming. Uh, fantastic community. Everybody, like Mike said, music. Music is a huge part of Atari Twilight. We have a brand new playlist for this, the second episode of the Twist of Fate season. Um, it'll be popping up in chat. You can kind of get that ready because we're going to be pulling from it uh, almost like a DJ. Whenever the mood strikes me, I will pull a song from that list. You can listen on uh, and hear exactly what my soundtrack would be for this particular episode. But before we go forward, we have to go back a little bit. We have to learn who our kids are here in Garrett, Maryland, taking place at the end of 1988 in the 80s that never was. It takes place in Tales from the Loop, but this 80s is almost identical to the 80s that might live on in memory except we have a couple more sci-fi elements. Robots seem to be a little bit more prevalent, helping to sweep the streets or uh, grav trucks float over the landscape as opposed to 18 wheelers driving across the asphalt. There's a mixture of what could have been and what was, but right now this is N 80s and we have a story to tell, but we need to know who's gonna help me tell it. So let's jump around and bacon. Tell us who you are, who you'll be playing, and um, what your type of kid is, the playbook or the designation of your your character, please. Yeah, so I'm playing Jesse J.D. Davis. He is uh, the type of character he is, is a bookworm, um, but he is kind of a mix between a bookworm and an athlete. Um, yeah, that's, that's him. Fantastic. And let's go over to Chris. Chris, who will you be playing? And what type of kid are you playing here in the 80s that never was? I am playing uh, Ricky. Um, he, Ricky is the class hick. Um, he is a hardworking farm kid who is hopefully safe and sound on top of a ladder. Yeah, let's put a pin in that. Uh, let's jump over to G. G, who are you? Who will you be playing? And uh, the playbook for your kid, please. Uh, I'm G and I'm playing Scarlet Blake today and Scarlet is a jock by class. Uh, she is a driven uh, to success football player. Fantastic. And you're also uh, wielding a large uh, wrench of sorts, a, a yeah, well like, cap. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah. Well, like some kind of hooked uh, wrench. Yeah. <laughs> And just remember, in any, I don't know, you might need this, in any applicable roles, you get a plus one because of that mighty wrench that you now wield. Yes. And last but certainly not least, Melissa, who are you? Who will you be playing? And uh, what type of kid will you be playing? Hey, uh, I'm Melissa. Hi, everyone. I'm super happy to be here. It's always super exciting to play this game with these people. Um, I am playing Heather Jones. Her class, her playbook is Weirdo. 
And uh, she's a big bookworm and such, but she's pretty socially awkward, uh, maybe made fun of a lot, hides. Um, yeah, she's just trying to figure out how to, how to, how to be a teenager. Fantastic, fantastic. And so those are our kids. Now, to a recap is something that uh, I would like to avoid as much as we can, can because we have a two hour session, we have a lot to get into. So we do have a, a YouTube playlist that you can go back and check the first episode. But to briefly recap the beginning of the Keystone second or, or primary season, our kids woke up on December 3rd, Saturday, 1988. And they each experienced something off about their town of Garrett, Maryland, whether it would be a dormant walkie talkie that roared to life with Morse code, or whether it would be a strange sensation felt on the family farm, or a vacant lot that is now filled with work trucks and strange sights. Each of the kids brought with them a mystery to their, their clubhouse. They elected to tackle the strange feelings on the family farm first. And with those kind of expectations of dread, they rode out into the country on two per bicycle. And when they finally reached the farm, they were met with, I guess, a realization of these expectations of terror. As Ricky was climbing up the very thin hand over hand ladder that let, let up the silo 40 feet into the air to open up the portal and look inside and see the levels of grain inside to uh, fulfill a task and chore that his father assigned to him. He was greeted with a strange blue light that was creeping through the loose matter of the grain, kind of shining through this material and, and whispering and with poked glows of light and lens, and a large blue metallic object breached the surface of the grain, at which time Ricky was told that he shouldn't be afraid and he wasn't meant any harm by whatever this was beneath the surface. At that same moment, down and away from the silo in the north field, Heather bore witness to the arrival of a pack of a dozen small creatures, these creatures seemingly on the hunt. And as they noticed all of our friends, we left the scene. But my friends, now is the time to continue a tale, a never ending story, if you will, of Atari Twilight, a Twist of Fate, of season threes of 1987s, 88s, and 89s. But right now, I need you to go to the Spotify playlist Cue up the song number one on the list, Heavy Metal by Sammy Hagar. I'm going to do the same because I need a little bit of a Sam in the background. All righty. On dark wings we fly, soaring and diving through a brilliant blue December sky. But this is not a joy flight. We have glorious purpose. We are not a parliament of owls. We are not a murder of crows. No, we are the weavers of telltale hearts and stories uncounted. We sail on dark wings and unkindness of ravens. And we have a legend to share today. Down we dive through low cloud all can see and a deep darkness only a few perceive. The Lewis farm stretches below us and a war is starting. We whip past the farmhouse and toward the north field where Heather stands alone against a charging tide of leaping and snarling green skinned creatures. One of them leaps atop a fence post, its shock of white hair reaching high in a lightning bolt, an approximation of a mohawk. It spots Heather standing alone in the field and a razor toothed grin splits its cruel face. Stretching its long neck to the sky, the leader of this hellish pack screams in a howl of bloodlust absolute. Ah! Then the rest pause for just a moment and mirror the wail. With another grin Heather's way, the mohawked leader leaps towards her position, suspended in the moment by the weight of terror and the rush of Sammy Hagar's lyrics. My friends, welcome back to Garrett, Maryland. Heather, 
you had a fantastic investigation role at the end of last session. You rolled a three when only a one was needed. Earlier this week, I told you that you could have a couple questions answered from a list that I provided you. In this suspended amber moment where the beginning of a battle is about to take place, we slip into Heather's mind as this realization reaches you and your questions can be answered in this shoot of a synapse. Melissa, what would you like to do? Um, so in this moment, after my brain unfreezes from shock and fear, uh, one question arises and that would be, how can I get out of this? So in this moment of, uh, of, there's a logistics moment that I'm sure Mike will approve of here as terror, <laughs> terror is pushed back for a second as your mind doesn't allow the fear to creep in. And for a moment you do the math and you know that where they are and the speed at which they're coming to you, you believe that you could make it back to the silo before they could reach you, you think. And so if you began to scramble or run, it would be a race. Is that what you would like to do? Yes, so as I, as I turn around, uh, I start uh, to scream, Scarlet, Scarlet! And I start running for the silo. As I'm running for the silo, does it, it, the door, it closes, right? Is there any other openings in that silo? No, the silo itself, like the, kind of the lower building of the silo, uh, for anybody that's thinking of kind of a, a point of reference, this would be uh, like a block or a donut around the bottom of the silo. This is a building where you would uh, put you know, wheelbarrows and tools and things. It's almost like a shed that is just specifically almost for the prep and maintenance of the silo itself. And so, yeah, you can definitely get to that. And it does have a latch to keep the door from kind of blowing in the wind, but it is a weak structure. You can see through the slats, you know, there's a good quarter or a half inch between each of the boards. It is not built to be weatherized or weatherproof. It is not built to keep the wind out. It is simply meant as a place to kind of protect tools from the rain and the snow. Um, but yes, you can get and secure the door. Will so I, I run forward uh, through the door and then I uh, slam it behind me and lean against it. Uh, oh, sorry, does oh, it open let's... inwards or outwards? Well, you're running right now. Oh, okay. And yeah, in, in this, this pregnant pause where you're running and screaming for Scarlet, our, the dark wings of our unkindness of ravens would split away from Heather. But for a moment, we look back and much like that opening sequence from Raiders of the Lost Ark, where Indiana Jones is running from a lot of very angry folk, uh, you are now running from a lot of similarly upset folk as you're uh, hauling ass through, you know, hair flying. Scarlet, you hear first the wail of the Mohawked creature, which JD and Ricky, you also have heard, but then you hear specifically a call for you, a call from Heather. And Melissa, would this be, is Heather dialed in enough to keep the fear out of her voice? Or is this no, something that- No, okay. no, no, she's terrified and it's trembling. Then, Gee, without the need for a role here, Scarlet hears Heather screaming and she can hear the fear in every syllable. Yeah, which, when uh, she first hears that weird creature scream, like she kind of perks up and like, what is that? And then, then she hears Heather's voice and she's like, her kind of eyes go wide and she, and she yells by like, Heather! And she will run to the door. I don't, I don't think we closed it. And so she'll run to the door and, and like uh, step, like run out and like, trying to like get her get her bearings to see where Heather is and I'm assuming I see her coming towards me and I have you, the wrench in my hand. Right, you do see her coming towards you. And as she is rushing towards you, you see behind her almost like popping like green popcorn. You see these, these beasts, these creatures as they leap and kind of dip and bob and run up and down. But <laughs> and from this position, as you see Heather in the foreground charging towards you, 
you look and you realize that each of these dozen creatures that hop and pop towards you have glowing eyes. Oh, crap. Hurry up! And she's, she's going to run towards Heather and she's just going to go, Janie! And so she's going to... Yeah, she's gonna in, run towards uh, Heather and like raise the the thing up. So Heather, you would see Scarlet charging towards you, like bringing this massive wrench up to kind of almost in a batter's position. As you two rush to meet one another again, you're not looking back, Melissa. So Heather has no idea how close they are. How Scarlet, close are they? They are super close. You can see as. Heather's hair blows behind her. One of them reaches and just barely misses grabbing a chunk of hair and pulling her back, presumably. But they are popping and grabbing and try, and they're laughing with these huge split fanged mouths as they reach and they know they are close. Scarlet, though, roll me an investig. Actually, no, you're, you're busy right now. JD, you heard all of this happen. You've heard yeah. the calls for Scarlet, the whale. You saw Scarlet sprint out of the shed at the bottom of the silo with the wrench brandished and ready for pain. But it is you, I need to know what you do in this moment. And then I'll tell you what I need from you. Yeah, I think I'm like, when, when Scarlet yells out for JD, I'm like, what? I'm right here. And then I'll like walk over to her or walk over towards the door if she's running that way and see what's going on. You see Scarlet charging towards a retreating Heather who is retreating from an army of popping and snarling green skinned creatures. Uh, I'm like, holy shit. Uh, and I'm going to look around the turn around, look around the shed area to see if there's another type of weapon that uh, Scarlet has that I can grab. Sure. I tell you what, what I'm going to ask you to roll here is um, roll me an investigate first. This is for what you see when you look out. In addition okay. to the, the charge and the retreat and the approach of the advance of the uh, little creatures. But um, roll that one for me first. Zero. As always, you can push. You can use your pride. Um, again, you can use your luck. Uh you don't have to do any of that. There are no, there's no consequence if you just elect to leave this role as is. But if you decide to push it, if you do fail again, there will be a consequence. And this one would be upset or be okay. scared. I, I, I'm going to push because the mind stuff is what I'm better at. So I want to succeed at this. Yes. And so once as you, you, you kind of draw your gaze away from Scarlet and Heather for just a second, and you see that a few of these creatures have dropped back. The, the rest of the pack, the majority of the pack is popping and moving forward. But of the dozen, three of them have stopped towards that, that point. You actually haven't gone out that far, but that point in the North Field that Ricky pointed to and said that there were scorch marks and, and you know a disturbance that his father had recognized. You see as these creatures just on the right at a perfect angle for you as like the dip of a small kind of rise lowers down. You have a, a full kind of flat view of what they're doing. You watch as their jaws unhinge and lower and stretch down to the form of almost like that mask from Scream as that gets longer and lower. And you see them scoop into the earth and you see them eating the sections of burn mark, the sections of the splash of what was earlier identified as that electric blue fluid. They seem to be cleaning the area. Hmm. Okay. Uh, I'm going to, I'm still going to look for something to help out that. Yeah. Yeah. Roll me another investigate. I will let okay. you know this, the higher your investigate, the better the weapon that you find. Okay. You I'm turn around and you see a pencil. Oh no. Um, you you uh, currently have a pencil. Rick, Rick, Ricky, I need something. I need something bigger than this. Again, you can push, use luck or pride as you make this call. Oh. You, I and mean, there's stuff everywhere, but you just picked up a pencil. You don't know why. <laughs> you just did it. No, yeah, I was, this is worthless. I'm gonna throw it behind me and I'm gonna look again. I'll I'll push. Fucking pencils. 
All right, what success? Okay, so as you throw the pencil back, you look down and you see a large kind of trident head, like a triangular spearhead. It's a spade. It's like a okay. something that would be used to trowel the earth. You're not sure if it's for masonry or for actual gardening, but it's one of the old kind, like built around the turn of the century. So it's got some heft to it and it's got a very absolutely dangerous point to it as well. But it stands about short sword length, yep. if you would, as you kind of turn back around with this this piercing weapon okay i'm going to uh <laughs> i'm gonna go out with uh with scarlet so i'll rush towards her okay so after a moment of uh, uh, equipping yourself you are able then to charge out after scarlet and we're going to put a pin in all of that for a second know this g Bacon, Melissa, you have a role coming up. It's going to be a combined role for the three of you. But we're going to go 40 feet up for a second. Ricky, you have just looked into a silo, your silo, your family silo, something you've done maybe hundreds of times before. As you look down, though, this is the very first time that you have been met with anything more than a field mouse that has snuck in here. What seems to be below the surface of the grain is decidedly larger than a field mouse. As this blue light creeps through and you hear in your mind, I mean you no harm. What is going through Ricky's head? And I will tell you what I need you to roll because of that. Uh, Ricky definitely does not recognize the voice. It's one of the one thing I've been struggling with since the last game. Um, he does not recognize the voice at all. Um, and saying, I mean, you know, harm is generally what the aliens say before they take over the planet. So he is not overly trusting of this gigantic alien in his silo. Okay, so in that moment, I need you to roll an empathy as you look down and the entire bizarreness of the situation grips you and you have that moment of, do I completely devolve into terror or do I keep myself together a bit? And empathize. Zero successes, Greg. As of right now, you instinctively pull yourself back, ripping your head out of the silo and away from the ladder. And as you reach for the ladder, that wrought iron rung slips through your fingers as you begin to pinwheel backwards. Would you like to push or use your pride or anything in this moment? But I'm gonna let you think about that as for a moment you are pinwheeling, your arms spinning, eyes wide as you are about to be reintroduced to your family plot. Um, let's go back to the and it, because of that empathize, you have no clue what's happening down below you. You're vaguely aware of your name being called by JD. You're vaguely aware of some barbaric, you know, wail behind you. But it's, it's that moment of self-preservation of, my God, what is this in front of me that you're not concerned about? What is that behind me? Um, I guess the fear that is seen or unseen. Let us go back down and what I will currently need from everybody, and I'm, I'm trying to figure out, I'm going to need a force roll from Scarlet as Scarlet comes in. Um, I am going to either need a move roll or a force roll from JD. JD, this is going to be what you elect to do in this moment. You can help attack with Scarlet or you can help get Heather away from the situation. Heather, I'm going to need a, uh, Melissa, I'm going to need a move roll from Heather as you all meet, you know, two lines of an army in mid charge. Uh, I think I heavy metal playing everybody. I think I'm going to use force because I look for a weapon. So might as well use it. Okay. So force from JD force from Scarlet move from Heather. You may push. And Use I get pride a, and luck. I get a plus one for my wrench. You do. Okay. Okay, I'm I'm gonna for it, I reroll that. 
with luck or push? Oh, um, ooh. I'll I'll use luck. Okay. Does luck allow you to reroll? Or yeah. Is that a success? Uh, luck allows you to reroll. Pride is an automatic success. Got it. Um, one success. I am not going to reroll because uh, Heather is not very athletic at all. And so I think it makes sense that she is dragging here. So this is what happens in this moment, this, this amber moment where above Ricky is falling away from the silo, Heather slips on a piece of ground and she goes down and one of the creatures jumps on her back. And just as she jumps on her back, almost like coming forward, like Jack Nicholas or Tiger Woods, Scarlet tees up and swings the wrench as this creature goes in the opposite direction. And as with a swipe of the, the weapon that he acquired in the shed, JD is able to fend off claw and fang for a moment. And for this brief moment, the three on the ground are safe in a bubble of violence that they've created for themselves. But the fourth is airborne. My friends, everybody go to your Spotify playlist and hit I'm Free by Kenny Loggins. JD, Scarlet, Heather, take five. It's the evening before. It is cold. We are here still on Ricky's farm, the Lewis family farm. And it is the end of what is always a long day for everybody involved, whether it's Ricky's parents who work the farm from sunup to sunset. And of course, Ricky himself, who goes to school, goes to work at the feed and breed, and then of course comes home to finish any chores that he has here at the farm. There's never an empty minute when you own a farm or are a farmer. And the work is never done. It's just paused and prepped to be picked up again the following morning. So, Ricky, you are finishing up in the barn and you realize that your, your father has come in and he has a, a cup of something warm that you can only assume probably at this time of night, strange as it is, is coffee, something to keep him up until he can go to sleep. And he walks over. Ricky. Uh, Come lean with me, son. Now, that's a strange statement, come lean with me, but Ricky, what you know about your dad for as long as you've known him your entire life, your father only ever seems to sit during meals and Sunday service. But when he relaxes, he leans. And so he goes to the front of the barn, the cold air kind of gripping as the doors opened a bit. And he leans against the open door, kind of waiting for you to join him. Ricky follows. He puts down the tool that he was carrying or whatever he was using at the time, uh, probably moving the hay that he was doing the next morning. Um, puts it down, walks to the opposite side of the door. So they're sitting on either end of the doorway and leans into the side of the door. As you come up and kind of join him, he starts to talk when he hears your approach and he knows that you're a polite boy. He knows that you're not somebody that's going to, to cause a problem or um, you know, ask him needless questions. You know, the, the, the privy of many parents is to answer those questions, but luckily your father's never had to do that. He don't believe he's the type of dad that would or would enjoy it. But as you step forward, he starts to speak World's changing, Ricky. To survive, we are, we're gonna have to change with it. At least it appears that way. Uh, your granddad, God rest his soul, uh, wasn't much of a, a businessman. He knew a great many things, but the, but the law, the law wasn't one of them. Honestly, I, I, 
I just don't know what he thought. And he didn't think much on beyond the current planning season. Come to think of it, I don't think I've ever known anyone as in the moment as your granddad. I guess that's why he didn't think about the future in 1970 when he signed a 20-year contract with the Loop. He didn't think we'd need the North Field for crop rotation. Guess he thought he was being shrewd selling the field in 1970 for what seemed like a king's ransom, but, but today it's only about a quarter of what it's really worth. I guess the bottom line is your granddad, he, uh, he just didn't think. At this point, your dad kind of sniffs loudly. You've never, he doesn't have allergies. It's not the time of year for allergies, but he sniffs nonetheless. We're going to lose the farm in a little over a year when the loop, loop takes possession of the North Field. Instead of trying to, to bleed to death with bank loans and a reduced yield, I'm going to finish what granddad started and sell the rest of the farm to the loop effective January 1, 1990. And for the first time in nearly 200 years, uh, Lewis won't have this land to give to his kid. He sniffs again and spits. You know, uh, cousin Kenny down in Annapolis, my cousin that's in the Navy, for the first time he turns, he doesn't look at you. He gives you that kind of side eyes. It's a, just a, a slight tilt of his profile towards you. Ricky just nods. Yeah, he has some pool with the administrators from the Maryland Military Academy for Boys. It's one of the very best schools in the country. And the, the boys that graduate almost always get in West Point or the Naval Academy when, when, when they're done. Cousin Kenny and I were able... We were able to get you into the MMA for the start of the high school next year. He sniffs again. I may not have a farm to give to you, son, but I'll be damned if I don't try and give you the best chance of life I can. Throws out the rest of his coffee. I'm sorry, son. I wish you could have grown up old here with kids of your own. starts to walk off. Better do this. And he just nods. He stops when he hears you. It's almost like he expected he expected a fight. And it's that moment when every kid realizes that uh their parents or guardians don't have all the answers. They can't fix everything. They have secret problems and troubles these secret problems and troubles that threaten to consume them whole, but they've kept hidden. And it's at this moment, a moment that every child goes through. Some of them go through it way too early, way too soon and way too young. But whether or not this is that moment for Ricky, it's that moment for your dad because he's laid his soul bare. And whether or not you figured it out before, whether or not you knew that, he was a man with problems, a man that was, was drowning. It's only now that he admitted it to you, which in and of himself is his personal greatest failure. It's a loss of innocence that he tried to keep from you, but he knows that he just can't. He starts to walk off. He doesn't say anything more to him. Um, he sits in the door, watches his father walk back towards the house, um, gives it a few minutes, sighs, turns back around, walks back into the barn, um, and just works to forget about the problems that are going to happen next year or in two years' time. Um, puts his head down, live in the moment work hard, forget the problems. And Ricky, in taking after his granddad, perhaps, and living in this moment, this cycle of the seasons, you're able to go back and continue your work in the barn. And at this moment, in something that uh, you'll become aware of the next day, eyes watch you from the rafters as they glow and wink and pull cartwheels 
and wait. And as we bleed back from that time to the following morning, we are in that amber moment of attack by the three on the ground and descent from Ricky suspended above on the silo. Uh, Chris, I will let you know that because you were the first to trigger a flashback, you are gifted with a new attribute called the price of a home. This new expendable commodity that you have is worth three free successes on any role that you wish. Once it's gone though, much like your farm, it's gone. So in this moment, you are spinning backwards away from the silo. I will let you know that you can use your pride for this session. You can push the roll or you can use luck or you can let fate decide what happens. Fate is fickle. Fate is very fickle. Um, I would like to use my pride for this, Greg. Um, Ricky's pride is I can survive in any situation. Um, and this seems like a survival situation. I don't think there's ever been a more aptly named pride for this particular, I can survive in any situation. Yeah, you can. Um, and so as you reach forward, it's almost with a force of will, you miss that rung, but you know instinctually that you are going to fall 40 feet. In all likelihood, you are going to be severely injured or die. And it's in that moment that you shift your boot from the rung and slip it between the silo in the interior of the silo and the metal rung, you fall backwards, but held on by your right boot, you dangle upside down and bear witness to the attack going on below. And with a crash, these groups hit. Scarlet, you punt one of these suckers into back whence it came. And it kind of plops and lands and spins amidst the ones that are eating. And one of the ones that are eating kind of chuckles ha, ha, as it goes by, seeing it kind of spin and wreck. And with a sweep, almost like a, a lion tamer keeping back a, a great cat with a chair and a whip with the other element claws hit metal as JD, you're able to keep these creatures at bay for a second. They are beginning to circle you. My three friends on the ground, what do you do in this moment that you have bought yourselves? Definitely gonna, Heather, get up! And she, if she has one free hand, she's gonna help Heather get up and then start backing away. Let's, uh, let's get into the silo. I'm can a, yeah, we, I'm can, a, can yeah. we get to the silo? Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna grab your hand and I'm just gonna start running with you, taking you there. Yeah, and I'll on, I'm gonna I'm gonna cover them. Okay, so I would like somebody to uh, uh, G, you're gonna be rolling a force again, but um, JD, I want you to roll me a move and you get a plus one because Heather is helping you in this situation. All right, here is the move. Come on, nice. Uh, okay, yeah, you guys are hauling ass now. This is this is. You know, you're not hauling oats. You are, I'm sorry, that's so bad. Um, yeah, so <laughs> you you charge towards the silo and with the force roll, another brave creature steps forward, but on the back swing of the golf strike, almost like you're uh, throwing a hammer from the Olympics, you spin completely around Scarlet and crack one of these effers again and send it flying again, this time kind of northerly. Um, as you strike it off on the side a bit, the creatures are very, their, their laughter and snickers have died. That, that still that demonic look on their faces is there, that bloodlust. But they realize that they're facing someone that has the ability to do them considerable harm. And while these creatures aren't unintelligent, they realize that they must be a bit more cautious with Scarlet. But they're beginning to circle. As soon as she uh, hits the other one and she's taking steps back, she she's just going to turn and, go and run. Roll me a move. And ahead of you, you can see JD as he and Heather make it into the shed. Um, Heather, roll me an investigate as you are being kind of not pulled, but you are both actively rushing back to this, this small shed. Well, I'm going to push my roll. 
go right ahead. Um, you can. Okay. <laughs> Hold on for a second with uh, Scarlett. Uh, let's go back. And JD, you're kind of pulling Heather into the, uh, you had the door ready to close. You're at the, the, the bottom shed of the silo. And Heather, that's when your eyes go up and you lock eyes with Ricky, who is inverted, hanging upside down on the silo. You can see that he has fallen. And like a bat, he is just clutched on to this structure by his feet. And for that moment, the two of you have eye contact. And because you are friends and because your backstories dictate that you spent quite a considerable amount of time with one another as far as you know, keeping one another company and things like that, there is a symb symbiotic relationship here too. And while this might be too great a distance to have a conversation, what the look that each of you give the other's character, what transpires between you two and this moment, this brief second as you catch each other's eye? Um, Heather's would be a combination of, oh shit, we're in trouble and I'll be right there. For Ricky, it's a case of looking down to Heather and just his thoughts are that they've been through a lot of shit this last year. A lot of bullies have been at them and they've weathered it all. So you got this. And with that kind of support that each offers the other, I am giving you each a plus one on the next role that involves the other person. So Heather has a plus one on any role that involves Ricky. Ricky has a plus one on any role that involves Heather. Um, make sure you write, that's only good for this session because I'm an asshole. Um, so let us, <laughs> let us cut back to uh, the move role. So, Everybody queue up because I'm gone too long talking and being an idiot. Let's uh, do Eye of the Tiger, if you will. And so with these two crushes of the wrench, Scarlet, you turn around and initially you feel your converse slip in the loose earth and you go down and you're threatened to go down face first and be swarmed by these creatures, these opportunistic little thugs that are behind you but you smash the wrench down and keep yourself supported with its length as you launch just out of the grasp of some of the, the leaders of this kind of counterattack. And as you're running, you don't hear the snickers and the snaps. I mean, you do, they're in kind of like a white noise periphery, but you hear Coach Saltz saying that he's never gonna have a girl take the field of a high school football team that he coaches and your converse moves faster, faster, faster as it pounds the ground and you begin to get such a head of steam. JD, as you look back and Heather and Ricky share that moment, you bear witness to Scarlet running and outrunning these creatures. You see almost a look of confusion as they realize they are losing ground to Heather Sweet. or to Scarlet. You see them falling back as they kind of run faster, no, not popping like popcorn. They're going full force, using their claws to get as much, but they can't get any purchase that gets them closer to Scarlet. Scarlet, you get there right behind Heather. And if you want, I will allow you to use your second success to kind of gather your friends and launch into. Yep. And, she, and she's gonna slam the door behind her. As soon as you do, you hear the pop, 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 as the entire structure shakes, as these creatures that thought they had you smash against the wood. You see a couple of the, like the weaker dry rotted boards crack a bit and you hear the, 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 the cracks of pain that these creatures go through. You are all for a moment inside this shed structure as you see shadows moving outside as they climb and begin to kind of go over the top of the shed. You see them reaching and trying to scramble up the sides and these odd kind of casts of shadow reach through the, the large cracks as do small talons that seem to be trying to grab the boards and yank them out. But for a moment, the three of you are inside the, the structure and you're not in immediate danger. Oh, this little shit. What are we gonna do? Oh no, Ricky. And she's gonna- Heather's gonna run to help Ricky. Um, 
because you've never done this before, I will need a move roll as you begin to climb up. But this does deal with hmm. Ricky. So you get a plus one here. All right, here we, we're gonna give this a try. Uh, she's gonna look up and be like, oh shit, Ricky. And she's gonna get up and no. wave the thing, or hold the thing ready to go. Now you can push the roll. A condition awaits if you fail. You still get the plus one. You don't, if any re-roll gives its benefits as well. Um, you can use your pride or you can use luck. So my pride is I've got a good mind and I can use it to overcome challenges like the heroes in the books do. Do I see anything here that could help that would not involve me physically having to help him down? <laughs> Um, you, Do you, I see you, a handhold he could grab and I can point it out to him, for instance? You're pretty sure that you're going to have to physically be engaged in this rescue process a bit. There isn't anything in Ricky's vicinity that can aid him in kind of rewriting himself. However, you do realize that there is a door in this section of the shed as well, a large door that you assume opens the silo. Now, if the silo is filled, opening this door would cause it to not be as filled as what was inside would come outside. But when you look, you do realize that draped along this for when the silo is empty is a large hook contraption that is attached to a rope. This is used to scale the inside of the silo and repair anything. Um, it is not currently active or attached to anything other than a pulley system at the bottom. You might be able to throw it. Uh, so Heather runs over to that rope contraption and says, hey, Ricky, Ricky, can you grab this? And uh, she attempts a throw of the rope in his direction. And you're using your pride here? Yes, I'm using my pride. So like a hero of old who sees the environment and uses it to their benefit, much like Robin Hood would take to the trees to avoid the Sheriff of Nottingham's men, or the, the, the children in a Narnia tale would use the weapons provided in unique and interesting uh, methods beyond the scope of what it would look like they would, you know, a shield is a mirror too. Um, and so with this hook, you are able to throw it up, but not, necessarily to get to Ricky, you throw it up and it gets tangled in the ladder itself. Ricky, you see the hook come to rest just at your arm's reach upside down. Now you'll have to grab it and let your boot go to release yourself, but Heather has provided you with a means to escape. It's the best chance Ricky's got to get out of where he is. He's going to grab onto that rope, pull it up to his second hand so he's got both hands gripped onto it. He wraps it around one of his forearms and then shakes his boot to either try and get the boot off or to get his foot untangled um, in the hopes that he's going to swing and not land on the floor. Okay. And because pride was used here, and I appreciate pride, um, you wrap your forearm around this contraption and you feel it give. And Heather, you witness the pulley. <laughs> as it's beginning to kind of like let out its line. And Ricky is falling down, holding on to this thing, but at an almost same speed he would as if he had just let gravity to have its way. But at about 15 feet, he begins to slow. At 10, the drag of this kind of end of the rope that's thicker and meant as a safety device catches in the pulley and slowing down until he is eye to eye with Heather. Ricky enters into the silo and that gaze that was shared with a 40 foot span now has one of four inches as the friends are reunited. Ricky sort of almost as his feet touch the ground, just looks across at Heather. Thanks for that. And he sort of gives her a hug to thank her for the, um, the, the rescue. Uh, I, I, I got you, but we need to help. With? Uh, we got some problems here. 
JD Scarlet. Yeah, the, the escape is currently going on as the two of you armed face the door that is being it's it's latched. You have a like a wood latch down and it kind of propped up. But at this point, it's the two of you that are really kind of holding up these walls as these creatures kind of continue their battering ram attack against the weak wood. What do the two of you do or what would you like to do in this moment? It's just pretty much just trying to make sure that they can't bust down the door and um, anytime um, something sizable like a hand or something comes through one of the cracks, she's going to crack it with the wrench. Roll me a force just for like the general mayhem that's going on and how much violence you dish out. One success. Yeah, and an appropriate amount of violence. Um, JD, <laughs> what would you like to do? Uh, I would ask Ricky, is there another way out of here? We got to, they're going to try and break through these this wood. I don't believe there is, Greg. Is there another way out? I mean, yeah, there's a door right behind you. Is, is Where does that lead? Came in? Is that the one into the silo? It's the one into the silo, yeah. Why don't we go up? We can go into the silo, but there's some big metal thing in the silo with the blue light, and he looks at Scarlet. Blue light. Oh. I don't, I don't you know, lighted the silo. I mean, is it is it what? is it worse than these these monsters? These these freaking monsters! It, and she's like, King. it did say it's not here to hurt us. We can try. Let's, let's go. Sounds okay uh, to me. Let's go. Better than this. <laughs> He's gonna these guys are the trying door. to hurt us. Now, I will say this, because of Heather's earlier use of the pulley system and the descent, there's now a rope there as well. So I'm not going to make anybody roll to get up the ladder. You'll be able to kind of like use both to kind of get yourself up there. Um, but as this is going on, Scarlett, I'm assuming you're going to stay at the bottom of the ladder and continue your like a demonic whack-a-mole where you're like breaking yeah. fingers and shit <laughs> as they pop through. Yeah. Okay. So uh, as these yelps and crooked talons kind of are both go in and then come back out of the, the uh, Scarlet's death range, um, who's climbing up the ladder and in what order for no apparent reason? Oh, no. Uh, Heather, go first. Uh, Ricky, go next. I'll help Scarlet and I'll go, I'll go after you. What? what? Oh, um, go. Oh, okay. Okay. I'm gonna head up the ladder, ladder as quickly as I can with any level of elegance. Absolutely, and you're able to climb up and you're able to get to that porthole that's still wide open that uh, Ricky was looking into. It is big enough for any of you to crawl into. You know, even an adult could crawl into the, this hole, but um, you remember the warning that Ricky said, something's in the silo. So Heather's in a hurry. She's going to go through there, but she's not going to look around because she knows there's something super scary in here. And if she doesn't see it, it's going to be okay. <laughs> the ostrich approach. I love it because that's the one thing GMs never think about it. If you just don't disbelieve the, 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 the violence, it won't be there. I love it. So you're just going to focus in and kind of climb in and jump in top of the grain. Is that what you're Okay, so as Heather jumps down, it shifts beneath your feet as the grain itself kind of gives away. You're standing on this loose matter, but you're able to stand for a moment, and who's next? Uh, Ricky's listened to JD. Um, and he's gone up behind Heather to make sure she doesn't fall or anything happens to her on the way up. Um, because she's just jumped in without looking, he dives in after her. Um, and as he lands, if all is well and he can, he's going to shout out, now's your, now's your chance to prove that you're not here to hurt us. Okay. And you kind of shout that as you like land in the grain for a moment, you're kind of like on all fours as you kind of shout into the matter beneath you. The blue light is not there when you land, by the way. You notice that difference. It's, the gloom is, is pretty dark in here without that light. Um, JD, you're up next, my friend. All right, I'm just like, uh, you're right behind me, right? I'm looking at Scarlet. Yeah, yeah, go, go, go. I'm going to toss this spade to similar direction in which I found it, and I'm just going to all the way up. You are able to get up there. Do you hesitate, or do you just enter into the silo? I think the only hesitation would be in which direction do I need to, to fall or jump down to not land on these two guys who are already down there. 
Right, right. And as you look in, you realize you kind of like pull yourself up on the ladder and swing your feet in and drop in beside Heather as you kind of hit inside of this gloom. Scarlet, you are you are standing against the, the onslaught. How do you make <laughs> your retreat? Uh, Shabir's just going to like take a couple final hits to the to any creepy fingers coming through the holes. And then she's going to just fuck you coach and she's just gonna push off the door and then run to the letter go and then scramble up as fast as she can um absolutely i am however going to have you make a move roll okay. there's nobody guarding your back yeah uh, zero i will push it <laughs> let's go fuck <laughs> three successes <laughs> Basically, Scarlet is, if you just tell her she can't do something for a second, she's like, you know what? Fuck you. Yes, I can. And so that's, that's the second time now um, with a multi-success. So with three, I am going to allow you to bank two of those successes. So if I ask you to make a move roll um, by the end of the session, you may do so at a plus one or two, whatever, however many you would like to use here. So you're able to get to the ladder. And as you're climbing, one of those little bastards breaks through the bottom like portion kind of like squeezes under the dirt and the uh, boards right at the edge of this shed charges towards you but you're able to like kind of mule kick back and send that little bastard back down into the dirt as he sits there and kind of scrambles like a crab on his back for a moment you climb up quickly you're the last one in and I give this to you for free you can do so without a roll but do you or do you not close the silo the door as you kind of come in um She's definitely gonna try and close it. Yeah, you said the door was broken before, so as well as the, well as she could possibly close it. Yeah, the top of it is broken. The, the little portal, like the porthole that oh. um that that's that's can be closed. You can't latch it okay. from the inside, but you can close it. You know what I mean? Yeah. You're able to do that, which thrusts everybody in the silo into darkness. There's a little light at the top from the damaged roof. A little a couple rays kind of creep in. Um, but it's at the point now where JD and Heather are close enough where they can see one another. Scarlet, you pounce down in the grain off to, you think, the left of where you saw uh, uh, Ricky down on his hands and knees. Um, all of you are kind of spatially aware of where each other is. Heather and JD are the only ones that can actually see each other in the gloom. And for a beat, you're in this kind of near darkness. What do you do? That was fun. Now what? Everyone okay? Heather, is are you it okay? over? Is it over? Uh, for now. Sorry. And, uh, yeah, they're but they're down there. They broke. They broke through. Can they? Can they get in here? Uh, no. Well, uh, shut the door. Definitely yeah. that. Well, they can climb. And Ricky starts to dig down. Greg. What are you uh, doing? He's moving grain to try and see if he can find that big metal thing. It's not time to count the grain. It's too high. It's way too high. This, it's whatever it is, is still in here. Yeah. yeah. What you? What did you see? It was a big blue piece of metal. The blue glowing light, which is gone, um, and it spoke to me and said it's not here to harm us. Which is kind of how all the movies start. She's gonna start like kind of moving the green with her foot a little bit. This girl, you're not quite sure where to dig, but I mean, this is a kind of a wide area inside the silo. Um, I mean, it's not massive by any stretch of the imagination, but you know, it, it's a good 10 yards across, like eight to 10 yards across. It's one of the bigger, fatter silos in uh, uh, Western Maryland here. Um, in fact, several farms would probably use the Lewis silo as a place to kind of restock during the, the winter. But um, as you're kind of looking around, the thing is, is that Ricky knows exactly where to dig. And Ricky, within about, you know, 30 seconds, you swipe and realize you don't go down into the grain, but it's almost like you're swiping your hand across the windshield of your dad's truck. And you see in front of you, it's not illuminated, but it's a, a splash, a length of blue glass. 
he tries to clear as much of it as he can and he calls to the others it, whatever it is is here it, it's glass and he just starts pushing as much of the uh, the grain off of it as he can she's going to jump start down helping. you're able to kind of clear this 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 large kind of parallelogram esque piece of glass but you're at that point now where as you sweep it it's falling in from the top you know you can't really there's nowhere to put this grain and it's still loose and so it's just coming back down you kind of you kind of push it off enough to get that piece of glass bare but uncovering the rest of it you'd have to kind of like sacrifice the glass and go somewhere else and kind of cover that part up to see if you can reveal anything else but just as you do that a light begins to glow from inside the glass and all of you are illuminated in this blue light as it weakly kind of pushes back the shadows. And you hear all of you from beneath this grain muffled as if it's um, under a bed cover after a scary story. But you hear, I can't see, is my boy with you? What the, what was that? We actually hear it out loud. You hear it in your ears, yes. What was that? What? Who? It's the blue light. See, he told you the blue light was here. And that it's piece glorious. of glass is glowing now, but it's very weak and it's pulsing. And so your faces are kind of illuminated and then darkened and illuminated and darkened inside this kind of campfire of technology that you're huddled around. We have lights at my house, but they don't talk. What are you? What are you talking about? Your boy? Who are you? I am Optimus Prime. What? From the comics? <laughs> She's gonna look at the three of them. Oh, who who reads comics? It's like um, it's like Randall Flagg, right, and Pennywise, right? Because we reread about them. Who reads comics? A lot of people Sometimes. read comics. I don't. I don't read them. Sir, sir, are you gonna are you gonna hurt us? No. There, there's I'm... there's bad things outside. They're here for me. I don't belong here. They were sent to remove me. What's this blue light? Is that, what is that? My life. And you see it kind of fluctuate. Whoa, 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 don't, don't go anywhere. You, you, I, I've, I've heard field. your voice before. You, you were in my head before. Weren't you? Ricky just stares at Scarlet. Roll me a charm, what? Scarlet. I don't have charm. Let's go. One success. I love, by the way, that I didn't eat this morning because I was super excited. And now my stomach is just growling like crazy. So I'm, if the hear, I'm the same. I'm the same. So if you hear a roar, that's, you know, whatever. It's um, a Langolier, right? It's right. It's exactly that's all it is. It's I'm I'm that method. Um, okay. So as you say this down, kind of speaking into this this glass that's pulsing, you hear very weakly. Bombs away. Yeah, you, you helped me before. What? And is she just gonna start like sweeping at the the grain a little bit? How can we help you? Can we do? Are you dying? Save yourselves. The creatures will not chase you well. I am here. Uh, then what? No, I don't think so, guys. I think we got a, I think we have it. How can we get them out? Ricky, do you have like a truck or something? Um, you have a tractor. All, all we got is the tractor, but uh, I don't know how we get him out of here because he came in through the top and broke it. I don't think we I can have, lift him out. 
I have lost too much energon. Save yourselves. Well, no, we we saw some this blue light. We saw it at Castle Grayskull. Maybe we could uh, get, refuel re, refuel you somehow. Like this, Carla. Didn't you say that there was some some of the blue light was over at um, the the the? Yes. Yeah, the there field? is. But they're eating it right now. No, Whatever the trailer. The tra the trailer. Oh, the trailer. The There's some in the field too. And by that fire. And Scarlet, when you remember the trailer, you remember that pronounced blue light that crept out of the door when it was open. It's the same light that you saw beneath Castle Grayskull and the same light that you're staring into inside the eye of Optimus Prime. We can, we can get, maybe, maybe there's some, uh, some of this uh, fuel in that trailer. Can, can, we, can, we, can we drive it here? Does anybody know how to drive? Ricky, oh Ricky, yeah, Ricky, you drive the tractor. Ricky drives the tractor. Uh, yeah, I can drive the tractor. Can't be that difficult to compare a car. I've yeah, driven my dad's truck around the, the lot, but not on the road. Well, sweet. But now, how do we get but, from here to there without those things eating us? But we don't even know how big this thing is in the trailer. Oh, that's true. Wow. First things first, too. How do we get out of here? I think just back the way we came. It was only a couple feet from memory. Greg, is that correct? It's only two to three feet so we can reach the door. Oh, yeah. You can absolutely get back out of the, the door that you came in because when you looked in, the levels were much higher than they should have been. Presumably because there's a large mass that's also taking up space inside the silo. Uh, Ricky looks down. Um, Optimus, um, can those things climb? Can they get up the ladder? I would assume. They're gonna get in here. If we get the, if we get you energy on, will that save you? Perhaps. Can you hold them off for just a little bit? Perhaps. I think we know what we got to do. We'll go. Yeah, we'll, we'll go really fast. We'll we'll help you. But how are we going to get past them? We have to get past them. They they are not. They hurt my back. We're going to have to run along the roof of the the shed down the bottom and jump off. Ch jump off. It's not that high. You'll be fine. And she she has that the, the wrench still with her. Like it was, she had it hooked on her arm when she was climbing up the the silo wall. Like we'll get we'll get you down. Um, you're not Together. sure how you know this. Yeah, you're not sure how you know this, Ricky. But um, maybe it's because you were the presence that has been around here the longest. But you feel that this next statement is directed to you. Save yourselves. But if you find my boy, help him. He is lost and must return home. Who is your boy? What's his name? Rob. Rob? JD, you would know this name from your walkie-talkie. Rob is a dumbass. Yeah, I think I even have it like with me and I look at it and be like, uh, guys, it has Rob's name on this. What? And she's just going to look over. Ricky leans down, puts his hand on the window, that all the glass that's there. We'll do our best. And, and we're going to have to run. I think for the first time, JD is going to try and talk into the walkie talkie. And I'm just gonna say, Rob, are are you there? <laughs> Over. <laughs> um, nothing responds. Again, you're not sure what the range is on these. You don't know if there's some type of amplification. Um, 
you're not sure, you know, basically of the general stats and how this works in conjunction with maybe others of its kind. But uh, when you fire it up, you do hear the continuation of that original Morse message that came through. This is, and see, this is the message I heard. You guys hear it? And as the uh, beeping goes through, it's very profound. You see that Optimus's eye begins to fluctuate with the beeps. It expands with the longer dashes and pulses with the short dots. Uh, Optimus, do you know? Do you know this? Do you know what this is saying? It is. I. And you see the light pulsing and it begins to drift. No, 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 no. Got There's... the fearing, power steering, pistons popping. Ain't no stopping now. Panama. As he, the blue light disappears. Oh shit. I see Dad. Uh -huh. Optimus, and she's gonna like kind of pound on the glass a little bit. What you you see there? deep inside the glass, almost like a suspended single star in a vast planetarium. It's just one moat of blue light. Save your strength. We're, we're, we're going to help you, okay? If you can hear us, we'll help you. Ricky stands up from the window um, and scrambles across the grain to the door. Flaps it open. Says, we've got to go. He doesn't look like he's got long. If we're going to get to the, to the trailer and back, we need to do it quick before that light fades. Can you, can you take your tractor? Out. Can you drive the tractor there? Or is that too slow? I don't know. It's slower yeah. than our bikes. Oh, okay. Where are the bikes? Okay, somebody run. Somebody somebody go. Heather, you got to come with us. We've we got to stay together. Uh, yeah. I'll stay with you. We can do it. We can do it. Okay. I think the bikes are just right outside the door. Yeah, somebody go first. <laughs> Ricky climbs up. Do I'm going to investigate when you get to the door, Ricky. I'm going to investigate. Yeah, I don't want to be a party pooper, open. but they were like 50 yards away <laughs> from the door. Zero successes, Greg. The light is, you know, whether it's the gloom inside, uh, a mixture of the daylight outside, you, it seems brighter and you squint. You, you can't really, your eyes, like walking out of a theater. Your, your eyes are unaccustomed to it. They're, they're reacting and you don't see anything in that moment. What are you doing? He climbs up. You can pull yourself out. You swing your legs yeah. over and it's still, you're still kind of almost doing this by feel more than anything else. You can't see where you're putting your feet, but you, you know where it is. Yeah, and he shouts back in. Last one out, make sure you latch the door. Give him as much time as we can. And he starts to climb down. Scarlet will go next. Roll me and investigate as you reach the top and look out. One success. As soon as you get to the top and open the door, you realize that the day is much brighter than it was. It's almost as if a gloom has lifted from this area, one that you weren't sure existed. The, the sky was not covered or overcast, but now it seems like it was, like the sunlight was having problems getting here. And for a moment, you hear on the wind the notes of a song, but before you can identify it, it's gone. But there's that smell of spring here in December, that, that warm breeze for a moment atop the silo and the sky is bright what do you do should probably pause for a moment and like in taking all this in 
and then she's going to scan down to see where those creatures are. What creatures? Uh, looks clear. Uh, they're not there. They've gone. Okay, okay. Come on. And she's going to start climbing down. Here, here, Heather. You go next. I'll go last. Catch me, all right, if I fall down? Yeah. I'll, uh, I'll descend the ladder. Roll me and investigate, Heather, as you pull yourself out of the silo. Two successes. And you needed two for all of the information I was going to give you. The first bit I was going to give you is you definitely noticed that the day is much brighter. You were unaware of how dark it really was when you were out here before, almost as if, again, the sun was overcast, even though you could see it in the day, you could see the, the crystal clear blue sky. But the second part of your investigation is the remembrance of a fleeting dream, where in your dream, you saw the farm of Ricky Lewis, but it was covered in shadow. It was deep within this inky black of nothing. And for some reason, you were reminded of a rule. They hate the light. Sunlight kills them. You're not even sure where it came from. I, it's like um, someone put it there. I, um, they're, I think they're, it's, uh, I think, I think they're gone. I think we're, I think we're safe for now while, while the light, while it's, while it's daytime. I'm okay with that. Um, yeah, I think we're okay, but we we should go. And I will uh, scram scramble down the rest of the ladder. She'll she'll slow down a little bit and wait for Heather, and and she'll be just like, "You got this. You're good. Just take your time." I I yeah, we we have time. They're not here. We I think he should be okay. We need to we need to, but we need to go get it. The 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 energy stuff. JD, yeah. back at the top of the silo, you are the last one to leave the area. And now with the brighter light coming in, um, replacing that, that, that blue kind of glow of the campfire, of the, the, the eye, the, the glass, you can see a little bit of the gray around the blue eye. And you can see that there is partially covered a larger blue piece of metal just against the side of the silo, kind of away from where you all had congregated. Um, and with the shifting of the grain, you realize that it looks like a very large finger. Hmm. Okay. I'm going to take a second to kind of try and uncover it a little bit. You're able to reveal three fingers of a hand. This hand is the palm of it is easily the size of an adult's chest and, and like torso. Gotcha. Okay, so I'm thinking this is Optimus. I'll just say, uh, we'll be we'll be back. We're we're gonna save you. And then I'm gonna climb out. As you're climbing out, roll me and investigate. Yeah. One success. You also realize that the day is much brighter here. And as you go to kind of swing yourself out and you're closing the door, you heard kind of the, the, the subtle movement and the shifting of the grain. But when you look back, you see that the entirety of this hand is revealed. And when you look down, just as the light kind of closes as you seal it, you realize that the hand is giving a thumbs up as you close the, the light from the interior of the silo. All right. Um, I'll just say we'll be back and then I'll start to climb down. You all get to the bottom. You are inside the shed that rings the silo. No sounds beyond those of the farm and its livestock greet you. No pounding. The evidence of the attack is there, split boards and, and kind of the, the dugout area beneath 
one of the boards, but of the creatures, there is no current sign. Um, should we check out the the burning spot? I did see like they looked like they were eating the the ground or something. There was like there was some blue light. Maybe you there's know, some maybe... energon closer. Yeah, but if it's in the ground, how are we going to get it out? Do we see any more blue on the ground? Um, I'll give this one to you all for free. When you get open the door and kind of creep out of the shed, uh, you go over to the area in the north field and you realize that these huge ruts are in the ground and mm -hmm. no evidence of these splashes or even the burn marks still exist. However, there's no area where it looks like this earth was deposited either. It looks as if these ruts were taken and removed entirely from this space. I will also say that JD, as you get there, you realize just as you kind of begin your investigation, you feel a <clears throat> and you look down at your shoe and you are standing in some type of green goo. Ugh. Bubbling and popping. Oh, ruin my shoes. What is that? It's. Ugh. Yeah, I don't. I don't know what this is. It's Ricky. poo. What? Ew. What poo's this? The monster, freaking monsters. Even the ones Ugh. that I hit are no longer there. Correct. Correct. However, as you all look around, you see other spots of this bubbling poo. It seems to be maybe, dissolving. Are these, what's, maybe these are what's left of those things. She can, uh, she'll like touch the goo with the tip of the, uh, the wrench. You kind of touch it and kind of string it up and it looks like green spaghetti for a second as you kind of lift it. Ugh. And as the sunlight reflects off the metal elements of the wrench, it you see, watch almost as if someone's lighting flash paper as it just <laughs> burns off the tip of the wrench. Whoa, crap, it's oh, just going to drop the wrench light. for the first time. <laughs> light hurts them. The sunlight really hurts them. Okay, good to know. Uh. That's it's really helpful information. Any lights? Oh, I don't know. Where's okay. our bikes? Are our bikes okay? Apparently, these creatures haven't learned to ride, and your bikes are fine. We we better uh, get going. Ricky pops back into the shed, Greg, and he flicks on the the lantern that was in the shed and leaves the it on. Powered lantern. Yep. Yeah. Um, and then. Before heading to the bikes with everyone else, he just looks at them, I'll be back. And he runs to a shed that's next to the house. Uh, and he grabs a spare inner tube and a pump to fix Heather's bike, uh, knowing that we're going to have to sort that out at some point. Uh, sticks it in a backpack <laughs> or a bag that's there, slings it over his shoulder, and runs back to join them at the bikes. And this I'm, is I'm your riding. house. Yeah. And I am, you absolutely get everything that you need to repair a bike. As he jogs back, bits to fix Heather's bike because your sister's terrible and gets ready to pedal on his bike. Yeah. And she oh, jumps thanks, on Ricky. Him and points the handlebars towards JD. I'm going back, right? Yeah. All right, let's go. Yeah, uh, just, just to recap. Back. <laughs> right. Just to recap, on the way out here, everybody, uh, there were two PCs per bike. So there was handlebar and seat riding and things like that. And um, in the ride out, uh, JD was pedaling and falling behind. And so Scarlett had made the uh, declaration that she would be pedaling on the way back. And so if that's still what you all had elected to do, that is, of course, what you can do. The time is now roughly 1130 as you begin your trek back to Garrett. Again, this is not mechanized travel, so you can speak along the way. It's a half hour, 40 minutes back into the town proper as the bike rides. Um, is there anything that you do during this 
pedaling montage as we see the group four on two bikes go by and does anyone know where this ben ben guy lives does anybody know ben rob rob rob, rob? sorry <laughs> this rob guy uh no I don't know. other than jd's note from the walkie talkie but like yeah. why why does optimus prime have a son named rob Am I the only one who thinks that's really weird? And well, he oh. didn't say his son; he said his boy. That's okay, true. I, yeah, I, I guess I guess that's true. I just assumed it meant like son, but does anyone else think it's weird that we're we're oh. we're going off to find some power for Optimus Prime? That that part's the weirder part. Not that potentially Optimus named his son Rob. But. I know that's such a. Is it is it weirder than? <laughs> is it weirder this is than like, the creepy clown? Yeah, this is like the no, conversation. Right, this is the conversation where like there's like the in depth like debate about why Donald Duck doesn't wear pants. Like it's like it's like that. That's like the level <laughs> yeah. of like kid concern, you know. So yeah. And you you kept saying Energon. Is that like his the name of his fuel? I don't I don't I don't watch Transformers. And she's yeah. like, what the fuck? I mean, are any of the robots named Rob? I don't think so. Robot? Well, that, that's what Optimus is, sort of. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like one of the like cleaning robots or something. Oh, from the loop? Yeah. Or you mean like, uh, I don't know. Uh, so maybe if it's not a kid at school, maybe it's one of the robots. Uh, I, I mean, we can she's check just the gonna comments. head down and just pedal faster because she's pushing double weight. <laughs> hey, well, so what are we, uh, Scarlet? What are we gonna be looking at when we get there? Like, is it just a trailer, or can we walk right in? Uh, there might. There, well, there shouldn't be any people there. Um, the, there was guys saying that there was gonna be someone there tonight, like overnight. Um, but yeah. Oh, okay. It's, it's like a construction site and Greg, what kind of construction site was it? Very undetermined. Now you did see that there was like uh, representations and signage that uh, it kind of indicated that this was an Alta site. Um, but again, you saw some of those subsidiaries as well, like the HVAC place. And, yeah. and there was uh, many different trailers that were more definitely like equipment trailers. This was more like a site manager trailer, one that, you know, uh, had more of a, not a utilitarian feel to it, but more of um, something that could actually be lived in. You know, this is had personnel in here instead of equipment. Um, but what they were building, you couldn't tell. There's no frame up. There's no like, like structure, like a, like an iron like endoskeleton or exoskeleton endoskeleton of like a building being going going up or a footprint of concrete poured you didn't see any of that yeah like it's like it was like an empty lot with this trailer on it and uh they had like cables and i saw some uh um signs for Alt alta you know we kind of see them all over town right um yeah. and then and she's like she's thinking trying to think about what they were saying and it's really weird that like they weren't, I didn't see them really building anything, but they said that whatever's here will be safe until- Until we steal it. Until next year, like, was it like February or something like that? I can't really remember, but- Okay. It, they said something here at the site will be safe until then, but there was nothing there. It'd be the blue energon. Yeah, maybe. Maybe the trailer is like a, it's like hiding something like that. Or just storing it. Yeah. How big was the trailer? Uh, it's kind of, it kind of looked maybe a little slightly sl uh, smaller than those ones you see at the trade winds, maybe roughly the same size. So the Santa John thing could be pretty big. Yeah, guys, I, I, I'm sorry. I am. Um... And I, I know I keep talking about my dreams and everything. I just wanted 
you to know that, you know how um, I saw that there was something wrong at the farm? There was also something wrong in Garrett. It was the same, it was the same, same darkness in Garrett. And so I think we should be afraid of the dark. I already am. Um, yeah, we should be afraid of the dark. <laughs> I mean, so, yeah. I mean, I'm not. Get torches. Make sure we got lights with us at all times. Is there a Flash headlight lights. on the bike? I would say oh. that, and this isn't me metaing anything. I, I think that um, Ricky's would definitely have some type of an illumination because he rides to and from school on the country roads. So he'd either have a tail light or some type of, you know, lighting apparatus. So he's not, you know, clipped while he's. One of those really terrible ones that you had to push onto the wheel that really slowed you down. The big motor to light the <laughs> Right, right. It looks like something that would be put on like a train, you know? <laughs> I don't think JD would have anything on his, unless Ricky put one on for him, but probably not. You all are getting to the, the edge of Garrett right now, and um, I will let you all know this. I know you're going to the... As indicated before, the lot is on the opposite side of town. So it's like through town and back out to the field. So there are things along the way that if you wanted to kill multiple birds with one stone, um, again, if this is, you can absolutely say we're going straight here and straight back out. I just wanted to let you know. So you, you I didn't inadvertently have you kind of cross right in front of something you wanted to do. Um, Heather's house is right along the way. If you wanted to, you just mentioned the, the uh, pump in the tire and um, the library is right along the way as well. So you can make any of those decisions or completely ignore me and do whatever you'd like. Oh man. <laughs> the life of Optimus Prime is in, is in the balance here. <laughs> I don't- Ricky's yeah. following Scarlet. She's, she's pedaling the other bike. Yeah, Scarlet's going. She's not stopping. Yeah, she goes straight sense. there. Okay. She probably she probably won't even acknowledge the library, and I she I don't even think she's been to Heather's house, so I don't even know if she knows where Heather lives. So well, if no one says anything, she would just keep going. Technically, right. we don't need to go to the library anymore. Oh yeah, because he freaking told us what he said. Mm -hmm. Roll me a comprehend, JD. All right. Where is? Do this at plus two because you've already sort of been working on this a two bonus dice please yeah cool oh four yeah Holy you know crap. this isn't this is not the whole message you know that whatever was given was a, probably about half of it oh uh, okay so whatever optimus said was only half yeah because you and your mom went through and and then when you guys mm -hmm. were in the clubhouse you put together how many words had t's in it and yeah. you kind of you probably got about half of the message if that's what it was and you you know, you, the first words were correct. The same ones your mom gave you. Um, so it's definitely looks like there's at least half of the message left. Okay. Okay. Um, but we're not openly debating that right now, right? We're just, you're just keeping, keeping on, keeping on. Okay. Yeah. yeah and, you, and you all have plenty of time to make these decisions before you get to Garrett. Like I said, I didn't want to slow you down or throw a wrench in the <laughs> works, uh, but just if there was something you wanted to do on the way, pick up an extra bike or stop at the library that is on the way. Again, ignore me or do whatever you'd like. I'm just trying to help out spatially. Yeah. Um, I think with everything that's happened, JD's all flustered too. So he is going to just be chilling on the, the handlebars of his own, of his bike. Just okay. let, letting Scarlet take them where, where she will. Okay, and then uh, uh, Ricky, I know that you're riding your bike with Heather on that one as well. I'm assuming you guys are just going to follow Scarlet. Just following yeah. Scarlet, yeah. We're literally following her for wherever she goes. Okay, so you pass by Heather's house. You pass by, uh, you know, the street that would go down to the library, and um, Heather um, Heather doesn't say anything about her own house, but she says, "Oh, that's the library. Maybe we can stop by on our way back." Yep. Okay. And as that's her indicated. 
Yep, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm interrupting all day today. No, um, she's just she just saying, sure, because she's <laughs> this is her third physical exertion today. <laughs> Get fourth, counting the little the fight that they were in. You need more it? eggs, right? And it's not even noon. <laughs> okay, so um, as you all pedal through the entirety of Garrett, you see that there's you know full swing with the tree lighting ceremony. Uh, the decorations by this point are up. The the streets are getting crowded with vendors and things like that that kind of creep to the northern edge of Main Street and then all the way down towards the direction of where trade winds and things like that would be. Um, but as you cross, kind of. Uh, perpendicular to that kind of splitting Garrett in half, you're able to go through and reach the other side of the town where it begun, begins to turn into fields. If you would continue along this road, you would eventually get to the vicinity of Castle Grayskull. But when you get there, you see the, the lot that was talked about. There's a um, not a paved parking lot, but there's definitely an area where whoever goes here parks their cars. As of right now, there is only one car, a large black SUV that is parked in the lot. There's no evidence of anybody on the site though. Okay. It's kind of, there's wide open, right? It, it's pretty open. I mean, now if you wanted to like sneak to any area of the lot, um, it is the daytime, so you know you don't have the element or surprise element of darkness. But um, there are just you know like those big reams of cables, uh, different materials. You see bags of what look like you know quick setting cement, um, other supplies you know like bundled up and kind of deposited uh, uh, two by fours of wood, and then the kind of other utilitarian trailers that probably have like you know like the mechanical equipment in it. Um, and tools and things like that. And then of course, kind of centrally located is the trailer that you saw, Scarlet, the one that had the light coming from it. So you can definitely approach and attempt to be stealthy. It's not like you're running across a field like a Civil War soldier or something. Okay. Um, so like, let's say like the this square, uh, sorry, the lot is like a square with the trailer in the middle. Where is the this black SUV from where we're approaching? on the very edge of it. So whenever you guys come down off of the, the road, kind of right on the area closest to you is a patch of ground that has what looks like space enough for several cars to park there, but there's only one right now. And it would be beyond that in the middle of the square where the trailer sits. Okay. So is there a way for us to go around to the back of this lot and approach from the other side? Absolutely, yeah. Okay. She's gonna be like, follow me. And she's gonna ride past the the, vet, the truck and head around. And uh, for all of my BMX enthusiasts, this is the part of town where the city maintenance ends. So just as you kind of ride up and go around what would be the back side of the square lot, you go off of the asphalt and onto what would be the dirt road, and you kind of and hit that that packed earth as you, it's still traveled quite a bit, but this is um, not maintained and you're able to get behind the area that you would like to be. Um, there's enough kind of foliage here and trees to, to hide your approach and the bikes if you wish to deposit them here. Cool. Yeah, so she's gonna, as they, when they pass the, um, the truck, she's gonna slow down a little bit so they're side by side and um, She's just going to explain to the rest, like, go in from behind, like the back of the trailer, and that way we can't be seen by this, that truck there, okay? You got it. Yeah, yeah. So then she's just going to just yeah. ca casually, <laughs> bike casually around the other side. Sure, sure. Um, as you all get over to the side, you don't see anybody observing you. Um, roll me a stealth anyway. This is just to blend into the environment more than anything else, to be the white noise of a town and activity. Just a bunch of kids, zero successes. It's a group roll. I'll let you okay. know that. Good, good, good. Nice. Oh, there, it's at the top. A, two. 
Okay, so yeah, you're all able to kind of blend into the background and uh, JD inadvertently does something that makes you all seem any even less conspicuous as he kind of, uh, you know, says something a little too loudly. You know, if somebody was sneaking around, they wouldn't be saying anything loudly. As you all talk a bit, anyone that's looking at you would have ignored you. Perfect. You're just, uh, just kind of like kind of calmly riding, like, la, 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 just a girl, ha, ha, ha. And then when we get, as soon as we get out of sight, she's like, go time. Let's go. <laughs> Stops mm-hmm. the bike and parks it. Yep, you're able to jump off and you have taken to foot. Um, there are there isn't a fence around this area, this construction, which is also kind of odd, because uh, even back in the eighties, there were things like, uh, "Hey, we don't want kids to stumble upon a, a work site and get hurt," but no fence up here. Nah. All right, and she uh, she's just gonna look left, look both ways, and then step out into the towards the thingy. Anybody that's going on to the lot, roll me and investigate, please. Yep. Scott, do you want anyone to oh. stay look out? Nice. Got Heather. <laughs> uh, Ricky turns to Scarlet. Do you want anyone to stay look out? Uh, yeah. Uh, Ricky will find some bushes then, Greg, or anything that he can sort of hide behind and grab a, I guess, quite a baseball sized rock but sort of a little bit smaller than that so that he can throw it and hit that trailer he wants to stay, stay in that sort of distance so when they're inside if anyone comes he can throw a rock at that trailer sure sure absolutely um as the other three as ricky peels off to become the lookout um the other three are kind of converging on that trailer in the center and in the middle of the stealth nobody really notices anything beyond the fact that you know, it's it's an appropriate level of uh, subterfuge and stealth as you're making your way in here, you know, as kids do running low and keeping yourselves out of the line of sight of adults. But Heather, you're used to doing this. You're used to, you know, pulling in among yourself and, and making sure that you don't stand out. And, but you're also always aware of dangers in your environment because unfortunately you have them at school and at home and at every waking moment, it would seem nowadays. And so it is you who, whether by these finely tuned senses, sheer luck or a combination of both, you hear two voices talking, getting louder as you approach. It's that moment where you hear them, realize that you're getting closer to them, but you are yet unable to or whisper to Scarlet and JD as this is all happening at once. And you hear the two voices, one of them feminine, um, but the masculine voice speaks first and you hear just the end of a sentence according to plan. And you hear the female or feminine voice say, yes, Dr. Arkaville. And that is where we end our session of Atari Twilight. Screw you, Greg. Uh, <laughs> oh, damn. Dude, how intense. Oh. I felt like we were in charge of so many. Uh, we were trying to save each other's lives and then Optimus, too. I mean, to be fair, I didn't think you were going to go to the farm first so you could get your fair. feet wet yeah. on some fair, other fair. things that might. Yeah, you, you might be let down with some of the other things you go to and they're not necessarily as deadly. But, you know, I mean, it. I loved it. Uh, let's go around and talk to everybody. And uh, I'm, I don't know if I'm stepping on Mike's toes or not, but uh, let's go around and talk to everybody and see where you are and where we can find you and all that great stuff. Uh, Bacon. Yeah, um, you can find me um, on Twitter uh, as told by Dice. You can also find me on the, the Twitch channel as told by Dice. We've created this channel uh, with all GMs and DMs together so that we could all swap out and be DMs and make sure that nobody was just that uh, uh, was always stuck in that role and that everyone got a chance to be a player. We play on Tuesday nights and we also have a one shot actually on Thursday that I am GMing on Thursday. I'm really excited for it. I've been working really hard 
on trying to figure out a way to make it uh, really fun and immersive. So hopefully it's good. I don't know. We'll find out. So yeah, you can find me Tuesday at 7 p.m. Pacific or Thursday, 6 p.m. Pacific for those two games. Fantastic, my friend. And uh, I, I mean, everybody here, we've DM'd, we've GM'd and all that stuff. It is so nice to be able to sit back and dive into somebody else's world every once in a while. So the idea that the DM gets their GM gets to rotate in and out, boy, that's nice. Refreshing a beautiful sentiment put into practice. Chris, my friend, how are you? Where can we find you? And uh, Ricky, going to military school. Ricky's going to military school. Um, I'm doing better. <laughs> Ricky nearly died. Um, I'm Chris, aka Necro. You can find me in the Unmade Gaming Discord. Um, there's links everywhere. You can find it. Uh, the only other place I will be is in two weeks' time for the Patreon campaign on Saturday at whatever time Mike tells us it is. Other than that, that's the only place you can find me. Fantastic. And let us go over to Melissa. Melissa, my friend, how are you? Um, how's Heather doing? And uh, where can we find you? Uh, Heather, I'm doing great. This was fantastic. I just love this game. I love playing with you guys. Um, uh, Heather is overwhelmed and uh, terrified, and uh, she's likely to stick to her friends like glue right now, I think. Um, I, um, I am such a fan of all of you people. Everyone should follow all of the things and watch everybody's games. You guys are all quite amazing. You are super nice. Um, I'm going to save G for last. So I am going to tell you that my name is Greg Grimjack21502. I am not on social media really, but I am currently in a uh, really super fun show over on uh, uh, Academic Foxholes channel, uh, Trooper SJP. It is a French resistance campaign set using the fate system on Friday evenings called City of Light and Shadow. I play an ex-Nazi who has joined the French resistance and um, it is gritty, it is realistic. Uh, Trooper has built it out completely according to the specs of history. Um, and we make it whatever we, however we can in a, a very kind of desperate situation. It's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun, despite that the, the, the cruelty of the moment, it is a lot of fun to be able to attempt to affect some change in, in the historical setting. It's great. But as for that, you'll see me here for season three of Atari Twilight coming soon. And uh, of course, for the continuation of this tale, Twist of Fate. And with that, I hand it over to G. My friend, who are you? Who were you playing? Uh, where can we find you? And then, I don't know, take it away. Here we go. Uh, yeah, my name is G Lightning Invoker on Twitch, Lightning Spaz09 on Twitter. Uh, you'll find me here. You'll find me uh, next week for the Patreon campaign, The Rise. Uh, you will not see me on the one shots because I have a stupid wedding to go to. It's not worth it. Trust me. <laughs> and um, you'll find me uh, uh, modding on MA Gaming and modding for Nomadic. And yeah, that's pretty much it, uh, for myself at least. Um, not quite done yet. Um, Mike, you're there still, I take it? Yes. You want to bring your goddamn nerdy face onto the screen no, here? I don't. Yes. <laughs> I don't, but I did. What's happening? Hi. <clears throat> How are you? Mm -hmm. I'm fine. Suspicious. Oh, no, don't be suspicious. It's fine. It's fine. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to let everyone know, <clears throat> if you weren't already aware, tomorrow, August fifteenth, oh, is the six year is the six year anniversary mm -hmm. of Unmade Gaming. Oh. Hey, congrats on that! That's awesome. Thanks. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So, I'm not gonna make. I don't have anything prepared in terms of. I didn't write a speech. Oh Christ. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So I just want to say that um, some of us have put a little something together for you oh, in celebration of this momentous occasion. Oh, God. Uh, so, yeah, I'm just going to, you know, I'm just going to pop something up in here for you. I'm going to put What's it happening? in the Zoom chat and I'm going to put it in the Twitch chat. What's happening? So this is just a little gift from us to you. And we hope you like it. You deserve it. You do. I don't know what's happening. Six years, dude. Your channel's the first grader. 
Hey! Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> That's cool as fuck. So if anyone uh, doesn't see in the Twitch chat, we, a bunch of us here, oh, um, Melissa, Chris, myself, um, <laughs> El Profo in chat, and Snow Dogs, who's asleep right now because he's on Aussie time. Uh, we put this, we started. That's the this. coolest shit ever. The fan, the, the official fan Eichmann. Wikipedia. Oh yeah, and Eichwin, I'm sorry, Eichwin, who could also not be here. He's off Where did party. you find that terribly old photo? Jesus. I'm not telling. That's Little awesome. Gave that to me. This is that's cool as shit. <laughs> wow. Yeah, so, so it's the it's the official uh, unmade gaming fan Wikipedia. We have a wiki page. Out. That's the coolest shit ever. I don't know what yep. to do with that. What do I do with my hands? Um, that's cool as shit. I like that. I like that a lot. That's awesome. Now I got to go dig through a Wikipedia page. That's crazy. You guys, oh, went, yeah. you guys cool. went back with some shows. Holy shit. Greg, remember Shroud? And then, and how then does, you got to help finish it. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, I don't know if anyone, if you're on mobile, oh, I guess wow. you won't be able to click on the link, but Anime Gaming has a lot, <laughs> a lot of content. Yeah, there's over th there's over 33 productions, not counting uh, the charity streams, the podcasts, guest appearances. So there's a lot of content here. Dude, Greg, Blade in the Dark feels like forever ago. I was young when we did that. I don't. I don't. <laughs> I feel like you only had one child when we did that. Yeah. Uh, no, no, I, I had two, but but he one was, was, he was very like very small. He was like a, yeah, he was like a baby. Holy crap, that's a long. Wow, that's a... Whew, we've been doing this for... We're old, Greg. This is a time. <laughs> a, August 15th. Ooh, uh, wow. 2015. 2015. Yeah. Jesus. Yeah. Jesus. Well, I don't know what to say. Uh, thank you, guys. This was a surprise. You guys did a whole secret thing uh, in there. Uh, that's cool as shit. Um, I'm not going to cry. <laughs> um, no, I, for real, though. Thank you, guys. That's awesome. I've always wanted to have a wiki. I thought that was the coolest shit. Like, yeah. famous people. And then you were wikis. like, well, yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add, add this Wikipedia idea to my list. And we're like, yeah. don't you fucking dare. Yeah. Well, it's like, it's one of those things. It's one of those weird, like, um, I don't know, uh, uh, Morpheus uh, milestones that you just put on your life where you're like, cool things happen when people do fan art. And then that happened. And I was like, that's the coolest shit I've ever seen. And then it was like, cool things happen when you have a wiki page. And now this. And then the other one was like, cool things happen when people live tweet you. And then that was also happening. And I was like, I don't know what to do. I don't have any more milestones for cool things. Now I just hire my friends is the, is the only, is the only remaining thing left. <laughs> I'm like, that's cool as shit. F 50, wow, wow. Six years. I feel old. Um, this is like my child turned six. Um, thank you guys for that, for, for doing this whole freaking thing, uh, and for forcing my face onto the internet, uh, on my day off. Um, <laughs> I haven't, my hair's not even done, guys. I didn't put any of my makeup oh, on. Oh, I'm on. shiny. I gotta have my, no, you um, look great. this was, that was really cool. I, now I'm going to dig into this. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know what to say besides how cool that is. Um, well, this is only phase one. That's, so that's fucking dope. That's dope. There's there's only so much we could do in two weeks. So. Yeah, no, that's that's <laughs> that's bananas. Uh, I'm here for it. I'm here for it, even though you spelled the company's name wrong. What? <laughs> oh no! <laughs> you and your capital well, U's and the URL. Oh no, I don't we have no control. Can't. 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 No, I know, I know. I've made a I've made a fandom <laughs> Trust page me, before. I was like, I've made and a fandom was... before. I just wanted to bust G's chops because I knew she'd panic. Um, thank you. I did. I was like, what? Yeah. <laughs> Who did I fuck up? Uh, thank you guys so much. Um, I, I am humbled by the generosity of a wiki page. That's the coolest shit ever. Um, yeah, I guess I guess that's it. I'm, I'm going to hang out here uh, with you guys uh, and do this outro. Thank you so much for being here. You guys are amazing. Uh, six years is amazing, so thank you all who are watching this as well. Um, that was super cool. Um, as always, if you guys like what we do here and you want to support the channel, go check out this fucking wiki page. Uh, but go check out our Patreon. Link for that down below. Join us in the Discord. Link for that down below. Uh, and if you guys are watching this over on YouTube or the podcast, uh, we do stream on twitch.tv slash unmadegaming. Uh, and we do have all those links and, and fun things all over the place. So come hang out with us. Be a part of the conversation and a part of the community. And I think 
I think with that, I'm going to I'm going to go I'm going to go play Pokemon Go. Oh yeah, I made a setting for Tales from the Loop. Go buy that. It's a uh, there's no link in chat, but go buy that. I'll link it somewhere. Uh it's awesome. It's called Glenbrook. Just The Google link it. is in the wiki. The link's in the wiki. Go to look at the wiki. It's over there. Uh but for now, I will see you guys later. We will see you guys later. Uh and from all of us to you guys, bye-bye. <laughs>